Lynn here has, um, you, you need to tell me about all the awards that you've won, because I think there's multiple ones. Go for it. Uh, so I'm Lynn, I'm a PD student second year here in Kenosaw State. Uh, that's, I don't have that many prizes. <laughs> Just uh, one poster in Vegas and a, re a more recent one in uh, Atlanta with uh, APCC and what's the name? Uh, Lexit Nexus. Okay, so the one that he won in Las Vegas, so I can brag on him because he's being a little shy, is one of six national awards. So can we give him a round of applause? Okay. And here he goes. Uh, so today I'm just gonna briefly talk about what I done in that poster in Vegas. So basically, what uh, the topic is to apply graph theory into detect virtual pattern from some customer. So you just imagine like uh, you have some uh, supply chain like Walmart or Kroger, and then you have customer coming in and like if you want to make some promotion campaign or so, right? You will need to know what kind of item people or your customer use to buy together. And uh, so my work is about how to do that using graph theory. So just uh, some overview. The input to my project is some transactional data. So basically, it has information on what people buy, uh, how many, and when did they buy it? Yeah, and the output of my project is just uh, to kind of cluster or group the item together, like how, what kind of item people use to buy together, or what kind of item have a high chain lead to other item being bought, or what kind of item have similar sales over time, and then how we can use the result, how we can represent the results in an insightful way for the clients. Yeah. And this project I did along with, I did it together with Dr. Priestley. And it's still ongoing. So let's just begin with a small example. Uh, just something I make up. Maybe people in work go to Walmart to buy stuff and they have some kind of pattern like this. So maybe, so first is uh, H0 here when represent an item uh, they are selling. And then you will see a connection between the two nodes if at some point in time, uh, people buy these two items together. And then the ticker lines will represent they buy the pair of items more frequently than others. And this uh, kind of really thin line will represent the connection are uh, not too strong in these cases. So uh, I just thinking maybe people win what? We buy ham and bread and mustard and cheese together more than if they buy bread and then beer together. And then if we can model our inventory into this kind of network, then we can, of course, like remove all the weak connection, right? And they will become kind of two item family. And now we know people used to buy this item together or this tree together. So that's just an example. A little bit about the data I use, it is provided by the client. It has about 42 million observations from 2014 to January 2016. And there's a lot of variable, but the most important is the order ID, which I like H will represent one order from the customer. And then item ID, one ID represents one unique item. The customer name, which I have to hide because that's what they want. And then the class, like retailer or vendor, the time and the quantity. And well the, the whole part, of, most of the part of my project is just to transform the data into the format that I need. And it's kind of really painful and long. So I'm just going to talk about the results. So uh, after that long period of transformation, I can get to some kind of graph that look like this, where again, each node here will represent an item. And then I can uh, visualize their frequency, like the red one would be purchased the most, and then blue, and then green, and then gray and white. And I can also show the connection between two items using the, again, the width of the lines of the connection here. So this is a small item family from one customer. 
And we can also have some other really big family like this, where we have a lot of items. Yeah. So again, uh, in this kind of graph, each connection appears when you see two items are portrayed together at some point in time. And the thicker the line is, then they are portrayed more frequently. And then we can also look at this size and color to indicate what kind of items are more important. Like the red one is purchased more frequently, and the bigger one means they are more important. And I also built some second type graph where the connection is directed. So uh, one way to interpret this graph is like if you see a 0 0.3 number here from lighter to beer, it means that if people buy lighter, then there's a 30% chance they will also buy beer. But then the edge going back is only 0.2. That means if people buy beer, then there's only maybe 20% they will buy lighter. Uh, so I just call that the probability graph. And in the, from the real data, we have some kind of graph that look like this. So here, uh, I'm showing, so the darker the node is, then the more frequently the item are purchased. And then, again, the size will indicate the higher probabilities. And just some example I get from the data. So they are real cluster, not like this fake one. Yeah, and kind of using the same technique, I can cluster item that has a similar, really similar trends of sales over time, like this one. I'm showing six items. I build a graph for them, I cluster them into group, and then you can see, so on the y-axis is uh, their weekly order quantity, and the x-axis is just the time. So you can see their trend is, trends are really similar, right? So we have all items has a drop here, and then some kind of peak here. And then some U curve. Um, yeah, so basically that all the outputs from my project uh, that can be delivered to the client. So is there any question? I have a question. Uh, so on the uh, these two slides back when you had the the all together like that. How do you make sense of that? This do you want, yeah, either of them. Do you look at a specific client and then you kind of move away all the other connections and you just see the, um, the connections for that specific client? Because looking at that... So it really depends on how you want the, the scale of your analysis, right? Like you can focus on, just return to the data. We have information about customer, about the their segment, right? Like vendor or retailer, and we have information about time. So it really depends on what you want to do. But basically, from the data, you can choose one night, one customer to use a graph for them, or you can even choose one uh, customer segment, like only vendor, or you can just choose some period of time, like uh, what kind of item are purchased together in January, and use graphs for those. Uh, it's, it's provided by the client. Uh, by what? By our client. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So it's just one method for the, for the client to use their data. There's no other question then. Yeah. Oh, what kind of software do you use? Uh, so I use SAS to transform the data and I use Python to visualize. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So I guess uh, I'm done here. Thank you. We need a round of applause. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So I know that Barkman has a, a, co a few of his own um, uh, fan club here. Who's here from Bogdan's class? Stand up. We'll give him a standing ovation. Come on. Come on. This is what you get extra credit for. There you go. There you go. All right. So Bogdan presented as well at Las Vegas. And um, I will let you do your own introduction. Do you know how to run this? Yeah. OK. Awesome. So um, the project I did, it was predicting successful uh, STEM teachers in secondary schools in the US. So uh, STEM stands for like science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So we were looking for teachers in, uh, the, the presentation I'm gonna show now is mainly math teachers, or it's, it's actually just math teachers, but uh, there's also data for chemistry teachers, physics teachers, biology. So um, to talk a little bit about the data, the data comes from a survey uh, from the National Center of, for Education Statistics. Um, so this survey data, it's a pretty comprehensive survey done for uh, generally high school teachers. And uh, to talk about how we define the highly qualified teacher in the data, um, a highly qualified teacher is a teacher who meets all three of these criteria. So the teacher has to have a degree in the subject they're teaching. They need to also have a teaching certificate in the subject they're teaching and at least five years experience in the subject they're teaching. Um, so based off of this, th these standards about like 55% of the teachers were highly qualified and then the rest were not. Um, uh, so to do, to, to perform the analysis on this uh, survey data, I used a logistic regression. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, just a regular linear regression. You have a, an equation in the form of y hat plus, so you have an intercept term um, beta zero and then plus x1, x2, and each, each, uh, each x is a different variable in the model, and they each have their own inter um, coefficient in the model. Uh, the, pro the difference between the model I was doing is that I said every teacher was either successful or not, or qualified or not for being a highly uh, qualified teacher. So everyone's either assigned a one for a success or a zero for a failure. So this equation here in linear regression, it's good for predicting uh, values on a continuous scale, but the values in the data we have are just zero or one. So using a logistic regression, it's very similar to a linear regression. It's just that by doing this transformation, the predicted values are now bounded between zero and one. So then you can now interpret the predicted outcome as the probability of being successful. So for instance, if your score is a 0.6, you could say that means you have a 60% chance to be highly qualified. Um, so to talk about the variables that were in the final model of the analysis I did, um, the region variable, so the region was broken into four regions, northeast, south, midwest, and west. Um, the school size, so I have a table here of how the school size um, variable was created. It was based off the number of students and then it was binned into one of 12 different bins. Um, so for instance, if the school had between zero and 49 students, it was just the first school size. And then between 15 and 99, it was in the second bin. Um, so there were 12 levels to that variable. Um, and then also there was a needs variable and this was the percentage of students at the school who were on a free or reduced lunch program. So like the data in this study included both socio and economic data. So the needs variable kind of accounts for um, the standing of, I guess, uh, kind of a, an income kind of variable for the school. Um, all right, so the results, so I'm gonna show, there's a few maps I've created to plot the um, scored um, data, but each school is scored and receives a data off, or is received, they, each school is scored and receives a score off of the, the model from their logistic regression. And again, the score can be interpreted as the school's probability of a given math teacher at that school being highly qualified. And then I aggregated the scores at the county level. So for instance, on this map, 
um, each county is scored, and then I've taken the average of all the schools within a county and plotted them. Um, so you can kind of clearly see the way the region was defined. So like the west region is this big block of blue, um, and then the Midwest. Uh, so generally the Midwest did the best in terms of the scoring. Uh, but I would like to tell you, like, keep in mind that I just took the average of all the probabilities scored within each county. So um, some of the bigger counties probably have like a mix of really good schools and really bad schools. So that's maybe why a bigger county doesn't do so well on the average. Um, but you can tell like some of the Midwest counties do really well. The Northeast again does well and the Southeast, it's pretty comparable to the Northeast. Um, so like again, like blue is the worst, then red, and then the greenish, and then brown, and then purple. Um, so it's, it's a pretty good mix. So like the West, you have a lot of rural areas. Um, so that probably adds to the reason why they do pretty poorly. But uh, I think the West region in just as a whole received, um, it just received a, a lower score than the other three regions. So that's kind of why the map shows this. Um, and then I also, I just picked the map of Georgia, so I guess most people should be familiar with it. Um, and then this is just the counties in Georgia scored. Um, so again, these maps were created in SAS, uh, the same thing that Lynn used. Um, and it's, the map functions are pretty, pretty neat. You can, um, they have county level maps, you can do zip code, like there's lots of different map functions you can do in them. Um, but I guess like on this map, like this is like Fulton County, I guess that's Cobb County. So you can see like how the counties score against um, the rest of the state. All right, um, that's actually it. So if there's any questions, yes. Did you look at the median instead of the mean? Uh, I looked at the min and the max also. I just showed the average, but like I took the minimum of all the ones scored and the max. The, but the median would also be interesting to look at, right? Not, not deal with the big and small counties and lot. Right. Yeah, I did the min and the max. So that, um, I mean, that there was. It's generally the same if you look at them, but um, the same pattern that is. Um, Bogdan and Lynn, they need to head over to get, um, first of all, snag your pizza on the way out the door. And uh, they're making a five o'clock class. So one more round of applause for both of them. All right. Now, I'd like to have um, the faculty, if you guys could come up here. I'm just going to introduce you. We'll talk later. Okay. All right, before you break for pizza, I want to introduce you to who you are uh, possibly speaking to. So come on and face them so they can see how you are color-coded. All right, so here is green right here. Green goes with masters. This is Dr. Sherry Nee. So that's who you will be talking about if you're interested in that. That's the accelerated bachelor's master's program as well. And this, um, over here we've got Professor Chowdhury and we've got um, DeMaio, and they are both in the PhD program, and they also teach some minor classes as well. But the real minor guru, which most of you are looking for, is right here. This is Michael Frankel, and so that's who you'll talk to about that. There are um, pieces of paper that you can pick up as well. Just to quickly highlight, we're not going to go over everything that you can read right here. For the minor program, you're going to be taking five courses, and if you're in psych, you've already got one of them out of the way. And so anyway, so you've got four more. For the Accelerated Bachelor Masters, this is Sherry's area. You can do 12 credit hours that will make it so that you can make two semesters or so off of your master's program and be done in about a year to a year and a half. And so that's Dr. Um, me right here who can talk to you about that. Um, and then for PhD, there's a, just only a couple of you that might be interested in that. We also have Jessica, you want to raise your hand? She's in our, our PhD program as well with all the other presenters that you saw. So um, help yourself to pizza. You now know who you're going to interface with. And uh, we've got about a 10 minute break here. Grab your pizza and then we've got our speakers back again. Okay. Thanks guys. What I wanted to do is just put, um, do a little bit of a cell job on you. All right, 
When you're doing a minor in statistics, and the big, huge benefit of a minor in stat is that it makes you marketable to the bachelors. Okay? So you may have a situation that, um, and there's our poster child. She's coming in. She's going to do our last presentation. She's in the job industry. But anyway, um, so what it makes you is like, let's say you have a psychology degree, and a psychology degree doesn't get you the job as, until you have like a graduate degree in it. Okay, but when you have a minor in it, then you can um, in statistics, then you can get and, and your bachelor's becomes sort of a terminal degree. So you can be making things like forty thousand a year, or I've also heard of fifty thousand a year with just a minor and any of the bachelors that you chose. Um, the other thing that you may want to be interested in is on your master's program. The, that accelerated bachelor's master's, if you're in that minor program and you figure out that you like it, you come out with 80000 but is the median salary in that um, master's program. And guess this is even more important, 2.5 job offers per person. When you hear from an MBA program, they'll sit there and they'll say, hey, we have 100% employment. But it's not comparing apples with apples because many of the um, companies are already paying for their MBAs to come in and take, get the MBA. So they've already got a job when they came into the program. But we're talking about, um, you know, you come in and we, we groom you and send you out into the industry with new offers and you get 2.5 job offers. The other thing that um, Jennifer Priestley was telling me <coughs> is that 40% of our master's students already have an MBA. So the idea would be that you can, um, if they're thinking that they need quantitative skills, then you can maybe think about it too, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, the, if you just Google data scientists, it's a big deal, and that's what everybody is needing nowadays. And girls, you may now leave. That was my whole speech. All right? So um, we're, our next speaker is going to be Sergey. Which could you be it right now? Because Denise is still coming from work. I just got here. Coming. Oh, did you just get here? Would you like to go next? And then we'll just go according to it, or do you need to breathe? Okay, Sergey, could you go with us? All right, Sergey is in our PhD program, and he will start us out and do his presentation. Thank you. My name is Sergey Buchumash. I'm a PhD candidate in data science at Kennesaw State University. And I'm going to present the poster, more simplified what I presented in Vegas, at the Analytics 2016. So basically, <coughs> my work was done how we can uh, combine the logistic regression with time series, because um, for the credit uh, modeling, for the credit risk modeling. So in 2008, when was the biggest fall in an economic um, Federal Reserve Bank started doing like a portfolio review of the credits for each individual banks. So what actually they uh, do, they go in each bank, take all the uh, uh, credits what was offered, and they forecasting if any of the credits uh, were going to, in time, if we're going to fail uh, to pay back, and uh, what is the risk. So. Um, is more of uh, updating the portfolio for the bank in, in time. So the data set, what was analyzed, is coming from uh, Equifax, and is not like a sensitive data, basically. It's not coming like how much money has the, uh, the company, how much uh, is spending, credit, the cards, and all the stuff. Basically, what did they offer it was the, um, how they paying the bills. Uh, how long do we have the, this kind of utility, like phone bills, renting, uh, the credit cards payment, the contract payment. So it's not giving the amount, but it's giving the time of the late payments or in-time payments. So data set was coming from 2006, 2014, quarterly. So each uh, data set had 1.7 million observations. The observation meaning that is customers and uh, in a certain uh, uh, period of time. Um, I started the logistic regression. You can see what variable, because we have 305, and uh, what 
variables is basically influencing uh, the model because some of the variables uh, are containing in another one. So ended up with the most, um, this was the most um, uh, influencing variables. So they are coded var variables, but actually the meaning are like, how do they pay on time? Were they paid late, late three months, 12 months, or 24 months? And <coughs> after building the model, I based on the internal credit, what do they have uh, from the um, company <coughs> providing the data set, they have a, a score. So uh, each variable was uh, waiting on their scoring. So I did, uh, based on that score, I did a cutoff point. If it's more than uh, 550, then they are good. If it's less, then um, they, they are um, subject to be failing. So I ended up with the following um, percentage of the distribution in the, in the data sets. Each one, what, uh, from all observation, what is, uh, I'm predicting they're gonna be good and what are gonna be bad. So zero is bad. Uh, one is, is good, so I'm, uh, because I gave it so low uh, cutoff points, because in the, uh, for co consumer credit scoring, usually they waiting from good and up to in order that you can offering you the, uh, the loan. Here I, I lowering down because we are a company, so if um, companies does not have right away the, uh, the money that you can pay back uh, or uh, the contracts is taking longer, or they have any litigation with the uh, service providers. So uh, for this reason, we have more of them good. So after um, fitting the model, I received the probabilities for each individual uh, customer observation. And I created the time ID basically from 2006 in the seasonality, season, seasonality uh, based on the quarters. So there was uh, new uh, variables uh, based on uh, age and month and forecasted the good uh, ones to see if, in case if I'm uh, offering the, the credit, do I ended up losing or um, I'm gonna receive back the money. So um, this was actually showing that um, we can see that the uh, payback forecasting uh, is increasing in the time. So since right now we are in 2016, we can uh, shorten the period of the forecasting or like in the, uh, two years from 2014 and validate the model, but we don't have the latest current data. This is the most available. So we can see that it's stating. So in case that ones which we forecasting is good and in time, uh, we see that the payback uh, we're gonna increase so we can offering the um, the credit and our portfolio is actually good in this case and so we don't have a, a, a loss and in the conclusions what i can say um was challenging because the most of the data like most of 75 percentage of the data was missing from the data sets so we cannot drop uh, every single what is missing because usually if we don't specify what we want to do with the missing data uh, as a system because I use it the SAS and I use it the base SAS and um, advanced SAS. Mo mostly I use the uh, advanced SAS for preparing the data. So if I was dropping everything, I'm not gonna have a meaningful um, model or results for the business because we don't know the coded data can be uh, something, some, uh, mo some data uh, zero or missing is meaningful. And we cannot uh, fit in with the zero. We cannot uh, uh, drop in from the model because we're gonna lose the consistency of the model. So if based on the ones variables which I selected, um, I imputed all the data, the missing ones. So what else I can say? And future research that I'm thinking on, uh, on this kind of uh, problems, um, I'm thinking to do separately uh, time series from all this period of time with these variables and combining them and see the, and comparing at the end and see if can be self-adjusted based on a new model, like building a new model which will be, be on a quarter or on a uh, 
uh, year we're gonna adjusting, but I'm not sure if we'll still uh, be something which can be accomplished or will be meaningful. And bringing the macroeconomics, because this the anal analysis does not have the, how is the economy of the countries, how is the index for like uh, stock market index and all the stuff. So if bringing this kind of indices, we can see in time what actually was bringing down what was increasing on, this period, uh, on or that period of time. And we can, um, like, if we bring in the uh, real estate, we can see one the fluctuation in the real estate that if does impacting actually the, the companies paying back their uh, lending money. Questions? Hey, our next group coming up is actually a team. Um, David Richmond and Denise Hernandez. They're from our minor program and they presented in Las Vegas. Okay, so come on in. So, and I'm David. And for this uh, project titled Cultural Data Nonprofits, we gather data from culturaldata.org and it holds lots of data, um, information, demographics that is inputted from nonprofits when they do surveys. And they, they do surveys when they are applying for grants um, for funding. So, another thing, these nonprofits um, are specifically nonprofits in the arts, so that means they specialize in either theater, drama, or something along those lines. And since I'm in the arts, um, the performing arts, I found this um, very important to me. Um, we chose four different variables, um, audited, parent, total revenue, and total support revenue. And audited just means um, if these nonprofits were audited by the IRS or not, and then parent is like if it has a parent organization uh, looking over it, so an example would be like here in Georgia, we have the High Museum, the Alliance Theater, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, which are all their own nonprofit performing arts organizations, but they're also overlooked by the Woodruff Arts Center, so that would be their parent function. And so the question we were trying to answer for this data set um, was really what would cause a nonprofit to be audited? Um, so what characteristics would cause an audit? Because I know a lot of times, every now and then, you might hear of a nonprofit um, being accused of tax fraud or something along those lines. So we thought, okay, what would make them be accused of tax fraud? Well, they have to be audited first. So that's our question. Um, so we noticed that um, those nonprofit organizations that have a parent function are more likely um, to be audited than one. No one that doesn't have a nonprofit organization. So if you buy like yourself, you're more, more likely not going to be audited. Well, that goes into, well, we ran three tests. And these tests um, we learned in our in STAT methods one. So we ran a chi-square test. And we ran a t-test and a regression, a simple regression. So for our chi-square test, um, which is a test of the independence. We found that companies that were audited and had a parent company, um, well, companies that were audited and did not have a parent company was only 458, which was about 98%. Um, but then companies that were audited and had a parent company was only about eight, which is a little less than 2%. I also forgot to mention, so in this website, there's about 50,000 nonprofit companies, but for this, we only selected a random sample of 1,000 of those companies. And with total revenue, um, this is the revenue that they gain from ticket sales, and the total support revenue would be like money that they get from grants or donations from people. And we saw here from this graph that there's actually a linear um, relationship between both of these revenues. Which makes sense because most of the companies um, get their money from total support. So, so we found that for our um, chi-square test, and looking at our t-square test, you can't really read these numbers, um, but 
the main difference for the companies that were not audited <clears throat> was about well, the mean for the companies that were not audited was about three hundred and forty thousand, while the mean that w for the companies that were audited was about three million, which is a huge difference. Just looking at the means, um, and looking at this plot for the line of the regression, um, well, for the test of the regression, we did get an R square of about six of point six six, um, meaning that about 66% of the revenue, well, the variation in the revenue can be explained by the support that they receive through funding. <coughs> so these are our hypothesis tests that we set up. Um, so for the chi-square test, we got a p-value that was less than 0 0.05. We used a significant level of 0 0.05. Um, so our p-value was less than 0 0.05, so we can conclude that there is a relationship between companies that were that were audited and well, relationship between the variables audited and parent, um, which is an well a dependent relationship. Um, when we look at the t-test. We again got a p-value that was less than 0 0.05, so that we can conclude that there is a difference in the mean on average. Um, and our looking at the regression again, it was less than 0 0.05, so we can say that there is a linear relationship between total support and total revenue. All right, so in conclusion, we were able to reject the null in each test because we got the p-value less than 0 0.0001. And of course, that um, no surprise um, that nonprofits were audited. They earned more money than those who were not audited. So of course, if the IRS sees that you're making all this money, they're going to audit you instead of like a smaller nonprofit that's barely making anything. Yep. So, um, we can also say that, well, some characteristics, well, to answer our question from the beginning, so some characteristics that we would look for to, that would mean a company is more likely to be audited would be they do not have a parent company and they make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, if you go back to the one more, one more slide there, yeah, that. So I noticed this is this one point out on the top right hand corner of the the um, linear regression. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much Yeah, so this would be an outlier. <laughs> well yeah, outlier or leverage point because it's yeah. it's it's giving you that straight line. Yeah. So if you didn't have that, like if you if you did a scenario where you took that point out and then see how the line fits, or the statistics that um, SAS outputs, we can actually look at that to see how, what influence that had on the model. So something to look at in the future. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's And we point. both thought of that. <laughs> yeah. We just didn't have the time, to be honest. But. You're learning, it. are you both in the minor? Yeah, we're yeah. both in the minor, yeah. yeah. You should learn, you should probably learn that in the regression class. Thank you. That's a good <laughs> Yes. So, do you have a feel for if one of the two variables played a bigger influence on being audited than the other, or they maybe somehow go hand in hand? Even? Between total revenue support and total support? Between, well, between parent company and oh. revenue. Revenue. Revenue would probably be the one that did most. Yeah, revenue. Because it shows more their data on like, how much money they're earning. Mm -hmm. You know, the IRS, because like, that's what calls their attention more. Yeah. Well, because the total support revenue makes up part of the total revenue. Yes? So when you get more time to do this, you're going to add more uh, non-profits to your sample, make it more than a thousand? That'd yeah. probably give us like, a better... Like, you know, all of them? Well, <laughs> at first, we did. Yes. Well, like, the reason why we chose 1,000 is because at first we tried to run it with 50,000, and that took way too long. 
for each test. Um, and then the graph didn't look as well either. Um, so, and then we tried 10,000 and the graph still didn't look <laughs> that great. So with 1,000, the graphs came out looking like that, which this looked a lot better. We can fix the time problem. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for that. We're going to swap. We're going to put you as the ant. Is that okay? Yes. And Carrie, come on up. Carrie Williams is a graduate from our minor program. She has the um, she has psychology degree, and she is now in the workforce. And what I would love for you to start with before you talk about what you did is I'd like you to figure out what you learned from getting hired. You know, the idea of there was 100 people and all those ratios? Yeah, so... Um, when I got hired, I went through my interview process. I learned... They, I've been working for this company. It's Primerica. We are a life insurance company. Um, we also do financial services, stuff like that. Um, I work in the underwriting department, so I'm underwriting life in insurance policies. Um, so I found out last week that out of 100 applicants, 40 of us were interviewed and six of us were hired. So I, I can firmly believe that I could not have done that with my psychology degree by itself. Um, and matter of fact, I didn't even graduate with the statistics minor on my degree. I was one class away. I graduated three months ago. So then the summer regression is not offered in the summer. So I wasn't able to complete it and I couldn't get an internship, which was part of my do part of my psychology degree but you know what I've talked about what I've learned is that if you're able to talk the talk and walk the walk and actually sound like you know what you're doing it goes such so, so long away I would say that my computer application statistics class learning Excel stuff like that is probably the best gift I could have gotten from my minor because or my, my minor because even be able to use statistic or um, Excel in like an efficient and like you know people use like, the basic knowledge of it you know you can create graphs and stuff like that but be able to have a higher knowledge of it than that um, employers are really really impressed by that um, right now I'm still going through the training process but my manager will send me projects like hey can you put all this in an Excel file and do a comparison of this company and this company or like this company and our company and be able to help us visualize that so we can show people who don't technically have a good understanding of statistics and I've given it to them and they have heard nothing but great things about my work. So um, that's probably what I've learned the most is that just being able to ha like have something on your um, your resume, whether it's you saying that you have the minor, say I'm proficient in Excel, I'm proficient in, in SAS, in R, um, all of that kind of stuff, it goes a long way, um, just being able to and have it. And tell them too, what you, out of those six that were hired, how many people have been on the job market for a long time compared to you? There were quite a few. Um, I'm the youngest person working in my department right now. I'm 22 years old. Um, only one other girl had just graduated from college. So um, a lot of the people have been there for years, but um, a lot of them did have prior, prior work experience. One girl worked for 911. She worked all of this stuff and had all of this experience in, in medical stuff. Like I did not have those things. Those things people were looking for, but it's it compared to the people I feel very fortunate to have my statistics knowledge that have gave me that extra push to be able to help me get my job so um, as a person right now I pushed myself through college I was I've been self-sufficient from a very young age um, I paid for my own college I've paid all my bills for a very long time and to be able to going from working paycheck to paycheck to have a job that gives me full benefits because of my minor um, has been very very helpful and I'm very thankful for it so um, Yes, absolutely. Give me just a second to pull this up. I have it in an email. This is actually my SAS Day poster um, from April of this past year. Um, I won third place. It was my first time competing. Um, honestly, getting me to do this was like trying to get me out of bed in the morning. Um, it took a lot of coaxing and asking me multiple times. And um, I was very fortunate to have Professor Hardy there with me to kind of uh, push me along my way. Um, but it was, a, it was a really fun, I definitely recommend anybody um, who's thinking about it and at least try it. Um, I did get a couple of uh, offers for um, some uh, internship opportunities, stuff like that, um, with some great companies, so. Let's see if it wants to do it. Okay, great. All right, you can stop. Okay, so this is my poster. Um, had it printed out pretty on a nice trifold. Um, 
basically how I came to this idea was it was a um, homework assignment that we had. We were comparing the violent crime rates before and after 9-11, um, part of my abstract if you read it. It talks about how, you know, after 9-11, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on, you know, um, there was a lot of uh, phobia towards people from the Middle East. People, you know, were, were kind of stereotyping those people. And, of course, out of people look, look through with a spotlight effect, they're like, you know, after this happened, all these violent crimes are happening, and they're linked towards these people, and people just get very narrow-minded. And so after this, this uh, homework assignment that we had, we actually found that violent crime has decreased after 9-11. Um, and that's what this box plot shows here, that the, the mean has actually gone down um, since 9-11, uh, since before and after, the, the blue being before and the red being after. So I started you know, kind of brainstorming, like, what, could, what could be the cause of this? You think about, you go to the airports now, um, there's a lot heavier security, there's cameras everywhere. You know, people aren't being incarcerated as much because they're being watched, um, which we know that more and more now as, as time goes on. So as I was doing my project, I looked at these output statistics here. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but it ranges from 1973 all the way down to 1983. And right here in the middle, you see a spike up to two and three standard deviations above the mean of violent crime. And I'm like, you know, I was looking at before and after 9-11, 2001, but what happened right here? Why is crime shooting up and then going back down? So during that time period, I found this chart up here at the top. It's the one in red. Um, we talk about there was a President Nixon declares the war on drugs um, in, see, it's 1971. And then 1984, there was a Sentencing Reform Act, stuff like that. So they started, you see, I'm trying to remember what I talked about. Never mind, thing. Um, basically, the war on drugs, we have a, a mass increase of, you know, drug use. You have cocaine going on there in the 1980s. People are stealing to get means, like money to, to acquire these drugs. They're going through, you know, further extent of like actions to find ways to, to fix their habit or to sat satiate their habit. Um, so you see a, a spike in crime there. I also looked at Rana Time series up here at this, this scatter plot up here on the top right. You also see a spike in, we saw it was 1994, um, where then it shoots down after that year is that Bill Clinton um, had implemented, uh, it was the crime, the violent crime bill, I believe it was. Um, the exact name of it, I'm not sure of. I know it's been a, a big a flare of it this past year with Hillary Clinton running, and um, they believe it may have an impact on her campaign as well. But basically, um, for every, if a city hired a certain number of police officers, the um, state would give them more money to uh, pay those officers and they would expand their prisons. So a lot of crimes started going down as people were taken off the streets, there were less crimes being reported. Um, so it was just very interesting. Um, I mean, of course, I found out that, you know, there was the, the, um, the fit plot for violent and property crime, that as violent crime increases, so does property crime, you know, the basics and stuff. But I found that looking at data, you, know, you can sit here and look at all the numbers and like all these, these little tiny intricate details. But when you look at the big picture like this, and you put the visuals out there, it just goes so far being able to explain things to people. You know, why is that spike there? Why is that dip there? And just being able to explore in history and adding the black and white and, you know, recognizing the gray areas, being able to put labels to them, I feel like it's a very par important part of statistics because if you're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about it, you're not going to get your point across. So that's why I really, really enjoy doing this, this presentation. And, um, and it was very rewarding knowing that I won third place, you know, my first year trying. But, um, but yeah, that's, my, that's my, uh, my poster there. And um, like I said, if you guys need any advice on SAS Day, talk to Professor Hardy. Um, she can put you in contact with me. I'm glad to help. Um, but SAS is definitely one of my favorite programs. I wish we used it at my company now. I've asked around and I don't seem to use it. It's not quite there yet. I mean, life insurance is different, you know, but um, it's a great program. I definitely say that if you guys get your hands dirty with it, it'll, you'll learn some things that you can carry on into your, once you, after you graduate and stuff like that. But yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to have Carrie tell you one more thing. She was telling me about when she got hired. What, was, what were they impressed with about you? 
you remember what you told me? She probably doesn't even remember. Okay, so. We talk a lot. <laughs> anyway, so my point is, uh, what she did is um, her boss, the person that she was being interviewed with, was, was impressed. Not only did she find the findings, but she went for the reason behind why it went up and down. And he commented on how that was a rare thing to find, and I'm sure that's what got her hired as well. So looking behind the data, not just being happy at, oh, it's significant. Well, so what? You know, and that kind of a thing. So give you another round of applause. Just, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Come on up. Here we go. Ruben's going to be our finale for this. He is the one that um, is doing tree species and some of the stuff I don't even understand what riparian is. So he's going to explain it all. He is also going to be, um, he's our Clendenin scholar. So he is going to be able to talk about a few things as well. So take it away. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, everyone. My name is Ruben Hilliard. Um, I'm what you call a non-traditional student. Um, I when uh, I started my uh, college career in Louisiana, um, but then Katrina hit and I got displaced to um, Atlanta, and there was a seven or eight year break. Um, I, I, I got displaced in my junior year. It was a seven or eight year break before I came and found KSU again. And um, I was in the biology program, and in that program there's a mandatory class, biostatistics, and everybody had warned me about statistics. It's so difficult and nobody gets it. And, uh, and then I took it and everything just clicked. Um, I found that I could make a career out of this. Before, I didn't know what, what I would do because I had friends that had graduated before me in uh, microbiology, biology, and all the biolog biological sciences. And they, they were bartending. They were making more money bartending than actually using their degree. So I was really concerned. Um, when I, when I came back to school, like, what am I going to do with just a um, bachelor's degree in biology? But then the light bulb went off when I um, took this biostats class, and then my professor told me to join the minor, which I did, and I saw the benefit of that. And then um, I started liking these classes more and more, and saw that I was good at it, and I was getting A's in all my classes. And then they, um, uh, there was... Um, uh, Eileen Verpspa told me one day after um, one of the competitions here that they have this accelerated bachelor's master's program. I should apply for that, so I applied for that and I got in. And um, I really didn't think that I was good enough to get a master's in statistics, um, but everything seems to just be uh, going really well for me. Um, uh, I now work at Piedmont Healthcare. I'm a business intelligence developer. I've been working there for a little over a year. Um, one of the current projects that I'm working on, um, predicting patients at highest risk for getting CLAPSI, so I built prediction models. CLAPSI is a, a central line acquired blood system infection. Um, each patient that my model correctly predicts and um, w uh, identify and do an intervention upon saves the system $25,000 and possibly saves the life of the patient. So I feel like what I'm doing right now is really important. Um, for this project, this was something that I started um, my second semester in the master's program um, because Dr. Nia told us that we have a project, uh, a kind of a capstone at the end of the master's, and I thought, well, what would I do? So um, my advisor is actually here too, Dr. Paula Jackson from the biology department, and I've been working with her for at least 18 months now on this project. Um, it is a... Um, controlled experiment, which I can thank uh, Dr. Van Brackle about that. He helped me set up the experiment in the greenhouse on campus, just around the corner. And um, I'll launch the PowerPoint. Uh, this is also my SAS day poster that I converted into a um, poster that I took to um, SAS. Uh, analytics experience in Las Vegas uh, just a few months ago. And what we're looking at here is because the, um, and I don't think it's debatable, but I think the climate is changing and I feel like humans have some kind of influence on that and maybe so, some people can debate that. But what we can't debate is what's happening um, to the environment, the trees, um, and we all need to breathe. 
So I thought this was an important uh, experiment to look at. Um, these are two species that grow here in Georgia and in the southeast region. You have um, the black sycamore and, um, sorry, American sycamore and black willow. So American sycamore is here on the left, black willow is on the right. And what we, what we know is that these species grow in riparian um, areas which are near rivers and streams. And what they, they do is very vital for the environment. They filter the water that flows through there and they also help with erosion and things like that. So uh, we decided we wanted to um, design experiments in the greenhouse where we, we would give them various treatments. Um, and there's this, um, I could go on for hours and talk about this, but there's a, a, a fungi called mycorrhiza that has a symbiotic relationship with these riparian tree species and uh, it grows around the roots of the trees. It increases the surface area, helps it ab absorb water and nutrients, and also protects it from heavy metals in the soil. Um, so we thought, well, maybe if we give these, these trees um, this uh, fungal microbiota, that it would um, protect it and help it get through longer periods of drought. So that was the other treatment that we, we gave. We, we, um, set it up so that um, we set up a, a randomized complete block design. So because a greenhouse has various microclimate variations, um, when you're setting up experiment, you're gonna decide what type of experiment you want to do. So in this case, we decided on the randomized complete block. So you add a blocking factor, um, the model, if I go back to the previous page, um, I don't know, you can, might not be able to see it, but it's kind of small. This is the, um, the model for the blocking factor, and what's important is, is that B right there, that's your, that's your block that we added in, and your error. And you want to reduce the error so that we added a blocking factor, which means that we just, it, it's very common in agricultural experiments to divide a, a plot or a greenhouse in this case into certain blocks and assign the treatments randomly. And so um, usually you decrease the error by doing that. So that was one of the reasons why we did that. Um, the other model that I'll talk about in a second was the mixed effects model. Because if you're taking readings on something over time, the same item over time, um, the errors are highly correlated. And so you have to use a, a mixed model to do that. Um, so we designed this block. We assigned all the different treatments. These were the four treatments. And um, we started it, I think, December 2014 is when I started the experiment. So we planted all these. Uh, we got the cuttings from a greenhouse. and. Um, we started growing them into the summer and for 10 weeks in the hot summer last year, myself and two other students, three other students were taking re readings in the greenhouse uh, with a device called a, a LICOR. And this is an infrared gas analyzer which clamps onto the leaf and actually watches it breathe and perform photosynthesis, which outputs on a graph and it, it spits out a bunch of data that gets um, put into CSV files that we can then use the data from the CSV file. And that's the um, physiological um, data. And then on the anatomical side, we took measurements. We took the, the length and the circumference of each of the plants. And so those were the two metrics that we were really looking at. Uh, some of the results here. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, I think some of the tools that are very important to learn in, in if you want to go into the workforce, got to know SQL. Uh, you need to know some kind of visualization program. I use Tableau on a daily basis, and then R or SAS. A lot of companies use R because they can't afford SAS licensing. So it's important to know that. So I've used all these tools um, at one point or another. Uh, these visuals are done in Tableau. Um, and I was just comparing the output from all the different treatments uh, that we gave. Um, 
Our conclusions right now, we're still in the process of synth synthesizing everything together, but um, our preliminary results um, seem pretty positive. We would have hoped that the mycorrhiza that we put in the soil had a greater effect, but it actually didn't. Um, but that's okay. Um, we found that platinus performed as well, slightly better than salix in this study. Uh, and once again, the platinus was the American sycamore, salix was the black willow. And so overall, the results are quite positive. Um, this is something that I'm working with um, Dr. Jackson on, um, getting it submitted for publication. So that, that would be the, the end goal. Um, and hopefully, researchers can use these results and um, be able to use either or, so either of the species for restoration projects within Georgia and the southeastern region. So that's the, the final conclusion um, that we are trying to portray to the research um, industry. Okay. Thank Anybody you. have any questions for me? <laughs> sure. I just want to say I remember you presenting the same, the same competition I did. I really enjoyed reading your poster and congratulations on your win because I just think this is a very important topic and everything you talked about being able to visualize everything is important and translating that knowledge to the public. I think it's very sure. important. Thank you. Any questions? Mysteries. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then you know what I want to point out is um, Ruben. What was the class you were supposed to be teaching that you went up to your job and rearranged all for us? Oh, tableau. Yeah. I, I teach. I teach um, tableau to basically all of <laughs> Pied Piedmont. Yeah. All of Piedmont. Yeah. So in, when he's being, you know, shy I rearrange about my what schedule. He does, he actually, if you Google his name, it'll come up under news articles, we're talking all over the place, where he comes up as this poster child for how to graduate and do well, mm -hmm. all right? <laughs> and, and so the other thing that I want you to realize is that he took time off work and rearranged his schedule for us. Can we give him another round of applause? Yeah, uh, to that point, I mean, KSU, it sounds cheesy, but KSU's done a lot for me, so I feel like it's not a big deal to come out and take my time out. Um, especially winning that scholarship, I'm an ambassador for the school. Um, you can go online and look what the Clendenin Fellowship or Scholarship um, does for um, the community. Um, and so all the ambassadors are out there to um, you know, basically sell the programs that we have here and, and tell students how good KSU is, how great the faculty is. It, everybody has an open door policy here in the stats program. Uh, you can go to them, uh, and, and some of them will, you can email 11 o'clock at night, and they'll email you back an answer. So that's how dedicated the professors are in the stats program. And they're really out there to uh, make the students successful, to get them jobs. Dr. Preci always says that there are no uh, stats graduates going hungry. Um, you always, you have a good job. I got um, a job offer. Um, uh, right in the ballpark of what um, she was talking about earlier, um, you know, the definitely not what I would have made um, with just a biology degree. So I highly recommend you look into the minor and also look into the master's program and move further because it's gonna, just going to open up so many doors for you in your career. You never know where you're going to end up and what you're going to use, but the tools that you learn here in this program allows you to hit the ground running anywhere you go. These are skills that all the employers in Atlanta and the greater region are looking for and they're willing to pay well for. And the thing is, they don't have to train you. You already come in with those skills. So that already sets you apart from the rest of the folks applying for that same job. So that's why you should definitely look at this program. Well, I just wanted to say that this big event was for celebrating our 10 year anniversary in statistics. 10 years ago, there wasn't an STAT prefix and now there is. And so we're starting and we're growing our programs and I hope that you will all be part of it. Thank you for coming.